Hey guys, right now we are live in Costa Rica with my friend Paul Saladino. We're answering some of your listener questions. Some of you are live and we are so excited. So let's get right in. Hey guys, we're actually live in Costa Rica with my friend Paul and today we're talking about fruit. So many people are afraid of eating fruit because they're worried about the sugar. They're worried about the calories. They want to do carnivore. Tell us what your opinion is on the fruit. I love fruit. I don't think we need to fear sugar and fruit at all. There are so many studies on fruit, fruit juice, and humans showing that it's healthy, decreasing endothelial reactivity, improving endothelial function on the inside of our blood vessels, Increasing oxidation of lipid particles, LDL, all these kind of things. There's really no good evidence that fruit is harmful for humans. There is a lot of fear around sugar and raising blood sugar, but these studies are mostly based in diabetics and there's a real confusion around diabetes. So sugar is not the cause of diabetes. Inadequate management of your blood sugar is a symptom of diabetes. So you can actually eat foods like fruit they don't worsen your insulin sensitivity. They may raise your blood sugar a little bit, but there's a huge amount of confusion around this. So blood sugar is a symptom of diabetes, not the actual cause of diabetes around your actual blood sugar. So inadequate blood sugar regulation, this is what is a symptom of what's happening in diabetes, but it's not the real problem. The real problem has to do with, the real problem has to do with foundational insulin sensitivity at the level of your fat cells, the level of mitochondria, whatever it's on your body, and that is related to something entirely different. Well, and you eat a ton of fruit and your abs are chiseled. Show everyone your abs. <laughs> so he's chiseled, he's still eating. And, the and there's fruit. also insulin sensitivity. So you can see that in diabetics, we can give someone with diabetes fruit, we can give someone with diabetes even honey, and their insulin sensitivity improves. So ultimately, diabetes is something that we're looking at in terms of insulin sensitivity. How sensitive are you to your own body's insulin? That is the pathology of, of diabetes. And sugar doesn't change that negatively. In fact, it probably improves that. And I know that makes people's brains just go crazy because they think diabetes, my blood sugar's high. Yes, that's a symptom of your diabetes. You don't just want to eat sweets on diabetes, but this is not going to cause diabetes. It doesn't worsen diabetes. You don't need to eat tons of it as a diabetic if you're not super active, but it's not the actual cause of diabetes. It's a real problem. And this won't make a normal human diabetic. And you can show that with my labs. You can see all my labs, all these kind of things like I'm very insulin sensitive and I eat a ton of fruit. I also eat a ton of meat and dairy and butter and raw milk and all cheese. Awesome. Well, you guys heard it first. So talk a little bit about juicing fruit versus actually eating the fruit. Because a lot of people are controversial. Some people say you can juice it, you can have it in a smoothie. Some people are like, you can eat it, but don't juice it. What's your thoughts on that? Yeah, so you can look at the literature. There are probably 20 to 30 studies of fruit juice, watermelon juice, pomegranate juice, grape juice, uh, orange juice, cherry juice, and they all show beneficial effects in humans, whether it's improvement in endothelial function inside your blood vessels, decreased oxidation of lipids, improvements in insulin sensitivity. These all come with fruit juice. There's all kinds of benefits to fruit juice. So the fears around fruit juice are that it's going to raise your blood sugar or that somehow the fiber in the fruit prevents the absorption of fructose. And uh, the fiber in the fruit is not going to prevent the absorption of fructose. You can look at watermelons versus watermelon juice, and they will absorb the same amount of calories from both eventually. Oranges versus orange juice, you get the same amount of calories from both. So the fiber in oranges isn't going to prevent you from absorbing the fructose. If you really look at the literature <laughs> with fructose in conjunction with whole foods, natural foods, it doesn't look like it's harmful for humans at all. All of the fear around fructose is based on isolated fructose studies in rats or uh, giving humans or rats large doses of sugar that's just outside of anything that humans would ever get. So if you actually look at fructose, when it's given with glu glucose, like a fruit or a fruit juice, it's not harmful for humans. Our bodies convert most of it to glucose, lactate, and other intermediates. So there's so much fear around raising your blood sugar. And I think it's all well-intentioned, but the science doesn't support that there's any Have you ever there. done a continuous glucose yeah. blood monitor? Yeah. And you've eaten it, like, let's say, let, how much fruit? Like, would you eat this entire plate of fruit and your blood sugar would not raise up too much? Well, your blood sugar might go up some, but the issue, the key point here is that's not a problem for humans. Mm -hmm. There's really no good evidence that, that means anything negative for human physiology. So all of this concern around people raising their blood sugar is incorrect when we look at the literature. So you could eat this whole plate of fruit and obviously like, okay, so I surfed this morning for two hours. 
I could eat that plate of fruit, no problem. Maybe my blood sugar goes up to 120 or 115 milligrams per deciliter. Within communities, in the health community now, within communities, there is this concern that raising your blood sugar to 120 or 130 is bad, and it's just not supported by the literature. That there's no issue with that. That's not unhealthy at all. In fact, that's normal human physiology that would have happened to us throughout our evolution many times a day, and there's no evidence that that's harmful for humans at all. So it's really just, it's just making people a little bit too conscientious about this, and it's creating some fear around these foods. Yes, you should not eat junk food. Yes, we should not be eating processed sugars and sodas and high fructose corn syrup. Those are completely different than this. And if we are concerned about raising our blood sugar, perhaps we can show a study when someone drinks a Coca-Cola, their blood sugar goes up and things are problematic. That's not due to the blood sugar going up, it's due to all the other things that are bad about the Coca-Cola. So this is not something to fear. Well, there we are debunking that myth. Go ahead, let's have a piece of fruit. Eat it. Don't <laughs> mango. Looks really good. Delicious. Did you guys know that 97% of Americans are deficient in at least one mineral? It's true. You need more than a dozen minerals for your body to function in its best, but with the standard American diet, it's almost impossible. So here's where B Minerals comes in. Guess what? All you have to do, take one little shot of this one, one little shot of this one, and guess what? It looks like this, but it tastes like water. Take one shot, and boom, in 30 seconds a day, you're getting an entire thing of minerals instead of an entire cabinet of supplement bottles. So with Beam Minerals, we make mineral balance simple. Okay, we are talking about a really controversial topic right now, vegetables. There are some people who say that vegetables are overrated and they actually can have toxins and some of you are drinking green juice and everything else and still feel miserable. What do you think about greens and vegetables? How could they be bad for you? So vegetables are the leaves, the stems, the roots, and the seeds of plants and plants don't want you to eat these parts. Very clearly, plants want you to eat the fruit that's colorful and sweet. Plants don't want you to eat these vegetable parts. Some people can handle vegetables, don't seem to have an issue, but the fact of the matter, if you look at botany textbooks, is that vegetables, the leaves and stems and roots especially, and the seeds, they do contain defense chemicals. They contain chemicals that are meant to dissuade humans and bugs and other animals from eating them in excess. So if you have persistent autoimmune issues, joint pain, GI issues, a lot of people feel better when they eliminate or decrease vegetables in their diets. You heard it first, get rid of it. Only oh, just maybe just a little bit. Try. <laughs> We're answering your questions live, and today's question comes from Brent DiGeronimo. His question is... All right, I have a question about histamines. I have an issue with histamines. I've been told not to eat tomatoes or oranges, citruses, or uh, avocados. What, what do I do about that? And should I just stick to meat or, or what? So let's answer Brent's question. So histamine issues are fundamentally an issue with the gut, and you want to work on healing the gut which can be eliminating certain foods that are damaging and irritating the gut or getting any nutrients that can help heal the gut. One of the things that could be very beneficial is actually eating stomach and intestine from animals. There's cultural ways to do this, menudo, trite, things like that, but so that's hard for some people. But getting nutrients, getting the things out of your diet that are irritating the gut, that's the key to starting healing histamine intolerance because oranges, tomatoes, avocados, these are all valuable foods that you want in your diet. It's not that you can't eat these foods ever in your life, it's just that you need to fix the gut first. Yeah, so we want to heal the gut. I will tell you, if you don't want to be eating an animal's stomach to heal your gut, I have a great solution. You guys have to try Gut and Digestion from Heart and Soil, best product out there. First, heal your gut because like he said, avocado is so good for you. I don't know about you guys, but I am stressed. And if you're feeling overwhelmed this holiday season, then I get it. With all the family get togethers, it is just a relentless source of stress. But anyway, there is something that I've got called Stress Guardian. And it's actually made by Bioptimizers, the people who make the magnesium breakthrough, which I love, love, love. But anyway, they are literally made this new product. It has 14 adaptogenic herbs and it just regulates your stress. I just actually took some right this second. And it's awesome. If you go to stressguardian.com slash waste away, 
and put in waste away for 10% off your first order. It's stressguardian.com slash waste away. Go there now. All right, so let's get your gut back in order, Brent, and then you can go back to eating this avocado. Delish. Paul doesn't like it, that's why he's not eating it. <laughs> but his gut can eat it, he just hates it. I got some good shape. Yeah. So doing the carnivore diet, I sometimes wasn't getting enough fiber, I, I suppose. So what should I eat? I thought beets was potentially one of the things that would get things moving, um, and does, but maybe that's not the best thing for the carnivore diet. So what should we eat to get things moving? I'm telling you, we get these questions over and over. What are we gonna do about being constipated? So Brent's question is around constipation on a carnivore diet. Definitely people, when they eliminate all fiber from their diet, sometimes get constipation. And so Brent is asking, should I put vegetables back in for fiber? Specifically, he's asking about beets. I'm not a huge fan of beets because they have a lot of oxalates. Oxalates can accumulate in the body. They form the most common type of kidney stone, calcium oxalate kidney stones. There's a lot of oxalates in the beet root. There's a lot of oxalate in beet greens, which are also known as chard. So I'm not a huge fan of beets to relieve constipation, but I think there's a lot of ways to get fiber if you need a little bit in your diet from fruit. I think there's better ways to get fiber if you don't poop well. Uh, when you're just eating meat, you can just add some fruit in your diet and that's fine. That's a better way to get fiber without the plant defense chemicals that come with a lot of vegetables if you're sensitive to the vegetables. So let's talk about liver supplements. Do those back people up as well? No, it's just very small. I mean, there's only a few grams in liver supplements. It shouldn't cause any problems with constipation at all. There you go. Let's talk about cholesterol for just a second. One of the things people talk about is they're going on these carnivore diets and their cholesterol is going up and doctors are recommending cholesterol medicine. What's your opinion? This is a really common thing that happens to people. We know that if you decrease the amount of polyunsaturated fats in your diet, like seed oils, which I think are very harmful for humans, and you increase saturated fats from animals like butter or meat on a steak, which I think is actually the healthy fat for humans, your LDL cholesterol might go up 20 to 30 percent, but you will also become more insulin sensitive as you're cutting out junk foods. And so I think what mainstream medicine is missing here is any sort of context around cholesterol. I don't believe that every elevation of LDL cholesterol carries any increase in cardiovascular risk. And I think that in this case, your cardiovascular risk is lower, even if your LDL goes up a little bit because you're overall improving your health and you're certainly improving your insulin sensitivity. If you look at the literature around cholesterol, it's very, very clear that if you are insulin sensitive, metabolically healthy, you have a much lower risk of cardiovascular disease and any elevation of LDL cholesterol does not carry the same increase in cardiovascular risk that you would see in someone that's like a diabetic or somebody that's unhealthy having an increase in cardiovascular, having an increase in LDL cholesterol. Guys, I just want to interrupt for just a second and I want you to hear Paul Saladino talk about why liver is so important. And if you don't like liver, we have another option for you. Your ancestors were eating liver. And the reason that this sort of wisdom has been passed down is because liver is very nutritious. It's basically nature's multivitamin. If you look at the nutrients in meat, they're great. You've got zinc, you got B6, you got B12, you got some K2. But if you look at liver, it really complements what's in muscle meat. And there are many unique nutrients found in organs, specifically liver as a powerhouse of these, that are difficult to obtain outside of liver. Like meat and organs are like peanut butter and jelly. They just go together. They're supposed to be eaten together. The easiest way to eat liver is just to do it raw. If you don't want to eat liver raw, you can cook it. But the reason that I like to do it raw is because there are unique nutrients in liver that are probably somewhat degraded when you cook the liver. This really is like the most nutrient rich supplements that you can find. And they are amazing. I have tried them. I absolutely love them. So just go to heartandsoil.co, use the coupon code Chantal Ray and save you some money there. So if you could pick your favorite multivitamin, what would you say? Yeah, it would be actually liver. It would be <laughs> an organ from an animal, which I think is the ultimate multivitamin. It just has so many nutrients in bioidentical forms, in bioavailable forms that the human body needs. If you look at most multivitamins, the forms of the vitamins and minerals on there are, number one, often not the same as what the human body uses. Folic acid is a great example versus folate. Uh, there's no folic acid in the human body. It can probably actually inhibit what we do in the human body. You don't want folic acid, cyanocobalamin, it's vitamin B12 and multivitamins, and it's not the form we use as humans. So all of those forms you get in the liver 
all those things are in liver and spades, and they're in forms that are bioidentical to what we use. Liver also contains hundreds, if not thousands, of nutrients that we don't even know about now. The complexity of liver as a multivitamin just absolutely destroys what's in your multivitamin or the multivitamins we took as kids or adults, right? So bioavailability, bioidentical. Okay, so you've convinced me I'm gonna do the liver, but here's the problem. I cannot stand the taste of liver. What are my options? So you can put it on a grill and add a little salt, maybe a little maple syrup and get it in small pieces. If you're willing to eat it raw, which is actually my favorite way to eat liver, and you know the liver is from a good producer and it's something you trust, you can freeze it and cut it up into small pieces and they're like little pills that you can chew. Or you can just eat it raw and thawed Cut it up into small pieces, you just put it in your mouth, and you use a shooter, whether it's sparkling water, orange juice, whatever, and you just swallow it. So you're it taking it like a pill. So you take it, you freeze it, cut it in little slivers, and then you literally pretend like it's a pill and just swallow it. That's if it's not frozen. Okay, so you have to thaw you have to freeze it, then cut it, and then put it like a shooter that and way. And it just goes right down, yeah. Wow. Well, if you don't want to do that, I have an even better option for you. I want to tell you about a supplement that's called beef organs. So you're getting all the organs. It's a lot less work. And this is grass fed and it's amazing. So use my coupon code and the link below and make your life easier. That's the easiest way to do it. <laughs> I'm just wondering what's the different, what's, which one's better, chicken liver or beef liver? I grew up eating chicken liver and I actually loved it, which call me crazy, but I loved it. But beef liver is more gamey, just like the difference between a regular steak or a bison. It tastes a little gamey and I'm not quite used to it and it's a little harder to get down. But is chicken liver really any less nutrient dense? All right, what do you think? Chicken liver or beef liver? They're both good. If you want to eat chicken livers, you have to cook them because of the increased contamination with Campylobacter and Salmonella. So you have to cook your chicken livers if you want to eat them. If you actually look at the nutrient contents, beef liver is better nutritionally, but they're both good. So I prefer beef liver, but they're both great. Just make sure you cook your chicken liver if you're going to chicken liver. And if you're like me, I don't like chicken liver, I don't like beef liver, neither one of them. I have an answer for you. All you gotta do is take two pills. These supplements are made with grass-fed organs. And instead of eating the organs, pop two pills, you're gonna feel like a million bucks. So I cut out most seed oils, but what about flaxseed oil or nagila sativa or black seed oil? Are there any seed oils that are okay? So what do you think, Paul? So it's awesome that Brent has cut out canola, sunflower, safflower, soybean, those seed oils clearly harmful for humans, fine, bleached, deodorized, full of benzene, traces of hexane, mm -hmm. problematic for humans at all kinds of levels in our mitochondria, clearly bad for humans. I'm also not a fan at all of flaxseed oil. When you crush flax seeds and you remove that oil, it's very fragile and it oxidizes almost immediately because the oil is composed of a lot of alpha linolenic acid, the omega-3 in that, we, we are told it's healthy, but it's actually even more fragile than what's in most seed oils. So flaxseed oil is completely no. Um, if you want to use black seed oil, maybe in very small amounts, but realize that any seed oil is going to be oxidized and very fragile. I don't see any real benefits, any of them. If you use all small amounts of black seed oil, maybe, but I think most of them, you're just better off without them completely in your life. So would you say olive oil, avocado oil, and are you, are, you, are you a fan of avocado oil or no? No. I knew you wouldn't be. Basically coconut oil or olive oil, that's it for you, is that right? No. Oh my gosh, what is it? Butter and tallow and ghee. Oh, I knew you were gonna say that. Yeah, so we should okay, say but, that. But at least olive oil, you're no. 75 plus percent of olive oils come yes. seed oils. Um, it's because it's not it's not pure. The olive oil you're getting most of the time it's not pure olive oil. Yes, yes. Seventy five percent of the time olive oil is cut with seed oils. Over seventy five percent of the time avocado oil is cut with seed oils. I don't know why people need liquid oils in the first place unless they're eating a salad, which I'm not a huge fan of at all. So if you need liquid oil, a good quality olive olive oil is probably the best. But a lot of them are cut with seed oils, and it has to be organic, extra virgin, cold pressed in glass. It's green. It's very, very small amount of olive oil. It's actually good. My son is obsessed with these chips. They're called masa chips, and they are cooked in beef tallow, and he loves them. And he is anti seed oils, and he is like, oh my gosh, you've got to try these chips. So if you want to get these chips, they are amazing. They are cooked in beef tallow, and they're really, really good.
Did you guys know that your thyroid's main food is iodine? And guess what? Mercury and other toxins gobble up your selenium and your thyroid glands need selenium to convert iodine to thyroxine. So if you have mercury fillings and with all the toxins and mold, your selenium gets, just gets gobbled up. So here's the bottom line. I take something called peak thyroid. It's got iodine, it's got copper, and it's got selenium. Everything you need to get your thyroid back to functioning without medicine. So go to ChantelRayWay.com slash upgraded formulas. Use the coupon code ChantelRay to get a huge discount. All right, so what do you do when you're at a restaurant? You're going out to eat. You don't want to have any seed oils. You're trying to get rid of What do you do to avoid it? The safest thing is usually the steak, which is what I'm probably going to order anyway. Most steaks are not marinated, but I make sure the steak is not marinated in anything because the marinades will have seed oils more often than not. If the steak is not marinated, I ask them about the grill. If it's charbroiled, usually there's nothing sprayed on the grill, and I just ask them, do you put any oil on the grill? It's pretty easy to find a steak that has no seed oils on the grill and is never touching seed oils. Sometimes you can find it with chicken or fish as well, but you gotta be careful with fish because a lot of times they'll put some marinade or they'll spray or baste it or um, paint some canola oil or other seed oil on the fish. So you have to ask a lot of questions. Beyond the meats, anything with sauces, you just have to ask the questions because a lot of times they're going to put seed oils in the sauces because they're liquid in the refrigerator and they are preservatives for the food. So, and most of the dressings out there yeah. are made with canola oil. Almost Even the one. nicest of restaurants yep. I've asked, mm -hmm. can you tell me? Now I have a card that literally says, I'm highly allergic to, idea. and it has all the different things that you're allergic to. Go to ChantelRayWay.com slash seed oil and bring it with you. Just print them out and make your life easier. All right, what is the worst advice you've ever heard someone give about weight loss? Everyone right now, they're wanting to lose weight, getting ready for summer. What's the worst advice you've ever heard? We are not fat as humans because we eat too much food. It's because we eat the wrong foods. The worst advice that I hear is to restrict calories or to count calories. That is not the way to lose weight long term. If you look at the studies, over 85% of people who lose weight dieting and cutting calories without attention to food quality gain it back, usually plus and more. more. And more. So this is clearly not the way to do it. Eat less, exercise more, move more is the worst health advice. The only way, I'll repeat that, the only way that humans lose weight and keep it off sustainably and healthily is to improve food quality. If you don't improve food quality, you will more than likely fail, regain the weight, and have struggles with this. So do not count calories, do not cut calories, improve the quality of the foods, which means all the ultra processed foods go out, just eat unprocessed meat, chicken, fish, beef, whatever, eggs, and plant foods, that is the way to lose weight. Love it. You guys stay tuned, we've got more coming up.